Hello, and welcome to Book Circle. I'm Earl Weinberg. This time we will be continuing our reading of Farther Afield by Miss Reed. Chapter 5 Recovery at Bent The days passed very agreeably at Amy's. Time hangs heavily, some people say, when there is nothing to do, but I found in my enforced idleness that the hours flew by. The weather had changed from its earlier brilliance, the sky was overcast, the air was still. There was something curiously restful about these soft gray days. The air was mild, and I sat in the garden a great deal, nursing my arm and propping my battered ankle on a footrest. Amy had a small pond with a tinkling fountain in her garden, and the sound of the splashing water was often the only noise to be heard. I felt stronger daily, and began to get very clever at using my left hand. I was more and more conscious how much I owed to Amy's generosity of spirit. Without her care and companionship, these early days of progress would have been much slower. During these quiet days, I had the opportunity of observing Amy as she went about her tasks. She dealt with her domestic routine with great efficiency, and I began to realize at the end of a week that without the method with which she approached each chore, I should have been alone far more often. As it was, she had time to sit and talk to me, or simply to sit beside me and read or work at her tapestry. I think we grew closer together in those few days than we had ever been before. Very little mention was made of James, although Amy did want say one evening he had telephoned to say that he was in Scotland and would not be returning for a week or so. The determinedly gay manner in which she told me this confirmed my fears that Amy herself was a very worried woman. It made her kindness to me doubly dear. One morning, I was taking my cautious walk in the garden, leaning heavily upon a fine ebony stick of James's, when I was horrified to see a corpse of a hedgehog floating in the pond. Obviously, it had tried to reach the water, toppled in, and been unable to scramble out again. It was a pathetic sight, and I was wondering how I could get it out when Amy called from the house and emerged with one of her friends, Gerald Baker. I had met him first at one of Amy's parties, and several times since then. He had been collecting material for a book about minor Victorian poets, and visited Fairacre once or twice to learn more about our one poet, Aloysius Stone. We in Fairacre are rather proud of Aloysius, who lived in one of the cottages in Tyler's Row, and was somewhat of a trial at village concerts in the early part of the century. He loved the opportunity of reciting his poems, and was apt to go on for far longer than his allotted time, much to the consternation of the program organizers and the outspokenness of his audience. This is a great day, said Amy, after we had exchanged greetings and Gerald had commiserated with me about my battered condition. She held up a book. Not the book, I said. The very same, said Gerald, came out last month. Well, and I didn't hear a thing. I'm not surprised. I shouldn't think a book ever crept out into the world with as little notice as this one had. But surely it will be reviewed, and all your hard work will have some recognition it's bound to. I doubt it. I'm not carping. There aren't exactly cues at the bookshop doors for any book, and one about Victorian poets won't set the Thames on fire. If it covers the costs, I'll be content, and so will be the publishers. By this time, Amy had walked across to the pond and was studying the floating corpse with some distaste. "'Give me a rake,' said Gerald, approaching, "'and I'll fish the poor thing out for you.' We surveyed the pathetic body, the shiny black snout, the brindled prickles, the scaly black legs. Amy returned with the rake. "'It's really dead, I suppose?' she asked, bending closer to examine the corpse. Well, I can tell you flat, said Gerald, casting his rake, that I'm not volunteering to give it the kiss of life. There are limits to the milk of human kindness. He fished the body to, to the edge and lifted it out. I think a distant patch of nettles or some rough cover would be his best shroud. You aren't proposing burial? I'm no great shakes with a spade. Good heavens, no, Gerald, dear, exclaimed Amy. Follow me and we'll put him over the hedge into the ditch in the cornfield, poor little sweet. 
Sweet, said Gerald, his nose wrinkled, is not quite the word for it. He followed Amy toward the end of the garden, balancing the dripping victim precariously on the rake. I watched the funeral cortege from my chair with some amusement. The more I saw of Gerald Baker, the more I liked him. He was clever but unaffected, sympathetic but not mawkish, and had a cheerful, practical approach to problems, such as this present one, which I found wholly admirable. No wonder Amy welcomed him. What about a restorative, she said when they returned. Gin? Sherry? Could it be coffee? asked Gerald. Of course, she went into the house. What a marvel she is, exclaimed Gerald. I'll endorse that, I said, and told him how wonderfully she had coped with me. Typical, said Gerald. I was full of admiration for the way in which she coped with that lovelorn niece of hers, Vanessa. I believe we may be seeing something of her before long, I told him. Evidently, she's quite got over that infatuation. You know she's in Scotland, working in a hotel? Gerald, to my surprise, looked somewhat embarrassed. Yes, I did know. As a matter of fact, I happened to call at the hotel a week or two ago. She seemed in great spirits. Did you hear that, Amy? I cried as she put down the tray. Gerald has seen Vanessa, and she's very well. Amy shot a lightning glance at Gerald's face and looked away quickly. He was endeavoring to look nonchalant and not succeeding very well. I was in the district. I'm collecting material for a book about Scottish poets, a companion volume to the Victorian one, I hope, and I remembered the name of the hotel. How nice. Is she flourishing? In very good spirits. She said something about a holiday soon, and I gather she may come and see you. That's right, agreed Amy. She poured the coffee. Any news of the young Scotsman who was being so attentive, she asked. Her tone was polite, but I detected a hint of mischief in her face. Gerald had recovered his composure. I didn't hear anything about him. No doubt there are a number of attentive young Scotsmen. Vanessa's looking very attractive these days, quite a change of aspect from the time she was in mourning for the Chilean. Bolivian, said Amy and I together. We sipped our coffee, relaxed and happy. A red admirable butterfly flitted decorously from flower to flower in the herbaceous border, and I remembered the pale, unhappy Vanessa, whose passion for a four-times-married foreigner had blinded her to all summer delights on the first occasion of our meeting. She had spent a week with Amy then, and I don't think I had ever seen my normally resilient friend quite so exhausted. "'And how's Fairacre?' inquired Gerald. "'What of my friend Mr. Willett?' I gave him a brief account of village affairs to date, and conversation grew general. It was half past eleven before he leapt to his feet, protesting that he must be off. I've an aunt living not far from here, and I'm taking her out to lunch. She's eighty-five and a demon for exercise. Think of me at about two-thirty, walking my legs off along some cart track. Come again, said Amy. I will, he promised, but no corpses next time, please. That afternoon, I broached the subject of my return home to Amy. I had been with her for well over a week, looked after as never before, and felt that I really could not impose upon her much longer. But I love to have you, she assured me. You're too kind. There are lots of things you must be neglecting, and surely there's a holiday cropping up soon? I remembered that she had discussed a visit to Crete earlier in the year. Nothing had been said about it while I had been staying at Bent, and it occurred to me that perhaps the plans had fallen through. That's nearly a fortnight away, said Amy. You'll probably need to go shopping. That doesn't mean you've got to go back to Fairacre. I pointed out that there were a number of matters to attend to at home. There were some school forms to be filled up and a certain amount of organization for next term. My domestic arrangements also needed some attention, though no doubt Mrs. Pringle's bottoming would be almost finished. I'm mobile now, I said, stretching out my lumpy ankle. Why, I can even dress myself if I keep to button down the front things and remember to thread the bad arm through the sleeve first. You're getting above yourself, Amy smiled. I really think you are getting better. She surveyed me with her head on one side. I can see you're really bent on going. I'll tell you what, let's drive over tomorrow afternoon and get the place ready and see if you can manage the stairs and so on. If so, I'll install you the day after. And so it was agreed. 
Amy took up her tapestry, and I turned the pages of a magazine. The thought of going home excited me. I should never cease to be grateful to my old friend, but I longed to potter about my own home and to get back to my books and my garden, to see the familiar birds on the bird table and to smell the pinks in my border again. Tibby, too, would welcome the return. Beyond Amy's window, the rain was falling. Gray veils drifted across the fields, blotting the distant hills from view. It made the drawing room seem doubly snug. I wonder how long it will be before I can do without this confounded sling, I mused aloud. I can wriggle my fingers quite well. How long does it take a bone to mend? Amy looked at me thoughtfully. Weeks at our age, I imagine. I'm not decrepit, and I don't feel old. I do now and again, said Amy, with a vigor that belied her words. I find myself behaving like an old lady sometimes. You know, never walking up escalators or not minding if young things like Vanessa stand up when I enter a room. I haven't quite got to that stage yet. But when I start pinning brooches on my hats, said Amy, resuming her stitching, I shall know I'm really old. There was a companionable silence. Outside, the rain grew heavier and began to patter at the windows. Of course, I think about dying now and again, I said. Who doesn't? What do you do about it? Well, said Amy, snipping a thread, I make sure I'm wearing respectable corsets, not my comfortable ones with the elastic stretched and speckled with rubber bits, and I pay my outstanding bills, and frankly, there's not much else one can do, is there, dear? But hope, I finished for her. But hope, she echoed. She turned her gaze upon the rain-swept view through the windows. There had been a dying fall in those last two words. It was plain that it was the sadness of living, not of dying, which preoccupied my friend's thoughts. And my heart grieved for her. The next afternoon we drove from Bent to Fairacre. The rain had ceased, leaving everything fresh and fragrant. The sun shone, striking rainbows from the droplets on the hedge, and it's in its summer strength drawing steam from the damp roads. Sprays of wild roses arched toward the ground, weighted with the water which trembled in their shell-pink cups, and everywhere the scent of honeysuckle humming in the air. In the lush fields, the cattle steamed as they fed, and birds splashed joyously in their way wayside baths. Everywhere one looked, there was rejoicing in the sunshine after the rain, and my spirits rose accordingly. As Fairacre drew nearer, I grew happier and happier, until I broke into singing. Amy began to laugh. What an incorrigible home bird you are! You remind me of Timmy Woolley. When he was, uh, what? When he was asked what he did when it rained in the country, I inquired. When it rains, quoted Amy, dodging a fat thrush in the road, I sit in my little sandy burrow and shell corn and seeds. And when the sun comes out again, I finished for her, you should see my garden and the flowers, roses and pinks and pansies. I'm sorry for children who aren't brought up on Beatrix Potter, said Amy. Look, there's St. Patrick's spire ahead. You'll be back in your burrow in two shakes. The lane to the school was empty, and we arrived unseen by the neighbors. It was very quiet. The village sunk in the somnolence of early afternoon. Inside the schoolhouse, everything was unusually tidy. A few fallen petals from the geranium on the windowsill made it look more like home, however, counteracting the symmetrically draped tea cloths on the error and the vim, washing up liquid, and so on, which were arrayed with military precision in order of height on the draining board. Every polished surface winked with cleanliness. Never had the stove flashed so magnificently. Never had the windows been so clear. Even the doormat looked as if it had been brushed and combed. Well, said Amy, gazing around, Mrs. Pringle's had a field day here. Awestruck, we went into the sitting room. Here, the same unnatural tidiness was apparent. I feel as though I ought to take off my shoes, I said. It's positively holy with cleanliness. The coffee pot on the dresser, behind which I stuffed all the letters needing an answer, now stood at the extreme side of the board. There was nothing, 
not even a single sheet of paper behind it. Save us, I cried. Where on earth is all my correspondence? Gone to heaven on a bonfire, Amy replied. But I must have it, I began in wilderment. Calm down, said Amy, or you'll break your arm again. This idiotic remark had the effect of calming us both down. We sat down somewhat nervously on the newly washed chair covers. She's washed every blessed thing in sight, I said wonderingly, and I declare she's oiled the beams too. Look at the fire irons and the candlesticks and the lampshades. It's positively uncanny. I shall never be able to live up to this standard. Don't worry, said Amy comfortingly. By the time you've had 24 hours here, it will look as though a tornado has hit it and it will be just like home again. It was one of those remarks which could have been more delicately expressed, or better still, left unsaid. In normal circumstances, I might have made some sharp retort, but Amy's kindness over the past week or so enabled me to hold my tongue. We sat for a few minutes, resting and marveling at Mrs. Pringle's handiwork before embarking on a tour of the whole house. It was a relief to find that I could negotiate the stairs if I attacked them like a toddler, bringing both feet to one stair before essaying the next. I could have wished the banister had been, left on the, been placed on the left-hand side instead of the right, but by assuming a crab-like motion I could get up and down very well and was suitably smug about it. And what about getting in and out of the bath? asked Amy, deflating me. I'm going to get one of those rubber mats so I don't slip, I told her, and I shall kneel down to, the ba to bathe so that I can get up again easily. Amy laughed. You win, my love. If the worst comes to the worst, you can always ring me, and I'll nip over and scrub your back. We checked the goods in the larder and made out a shopping list, and then went to inspect the garden. As well as Timmy Willie's roses and pinks and pansies, the purple clematis had come out, the velvety flowers glorious against the old bricks of the house. We sat together on the rustic seat warmed by the sun and tilted up our faces to the blaze as thankfully as the daisies on the grass. Tomorrow, I thought, I shall be back for good. As if reading my thoughts, Amy spoke. No place like home, eh? She sounded relaxed and slightly amused at my happiness. None, I said fervently. Chapter 6 Amy Needs Help I woke next morning in jubilant spirits. Through the bedroom window I could see two men examining the standing corn. No doubt the farmer was hoping to start cutting later in the day when the dew had vanished. I should not be there to see it, I thought happily. The harvest fields of Bent would be far distant. I should be watching Mr. Roberts, our local farmer, trundling the combine round our fair-acre fields. But that would be a week or so later, for our uplands are colder than the southward slopes of Amy's countryside, and all our crops are a little later. Amy and I lingered over our coffee cups. I was looking hopefully among the newspaper column for, for some crumb of cheer among the warfare, murders, rapes, and attacks upon old men and women for any small change they might have had upon them, without, as usual, much success. Amy was busy with her letters. She had left until last a bulky envelope addressed in James's unmistakable hand. She slit it open, her face grave, and gave the pages her close attention. I refilled her coffee cup and my own in the silence and turned to the absorbing account of a woman with nine children and a tenth on the way who had struck her husband over the head with a handy frying pan after some little difference about methods of birth control. She was reported as saying, he didn't like interfering with nature and I was glad to see that her solicitor was putting up a spirited defense. I wished her luck. Really, marriage was no bed of roses for some women, I thought, congratulating myself yet again on my single state. The rustling of paper brought me back to the present. Amy was stuffing the letter back into the envelope. Her mouth was set grimly, and I looked hastily at the newspaper again. I was conscious that Amy was staring blindly across the cornfields. I finished my coffee and rose. If you'll excuse me, I said, I'll go finish packing. 
There was no reply from Amy. Still as a statue, she stared stonily before her as I crept away. An hour or so later, we packed up the car together. Amy seemed to have recovered her good humor, and we laughed about the amount of luggage I seemed to have accumulated. Tibby's basket took up a goodly part of the back seat, and old Macintosh had been folded and placed strategically beneath it. We had had trouble before, and were determined to prevent Amy's lovely car smelling like a civet's paradise, to quote Mr. Willett, referring to the poet Aloysius Stone's noisome house of long ago. Two cases, a pile of books, a bulky dressing gown, and a basket of vegetables and flowers from Amy's garden filled the rest of the back seat and the boot, and we still had a box of groceries to collect from Bent's Village stores. Anyone would think we're off for a fortnight's holiday, observed Amy, surveying the luggage. Well, you will be soon, I said. Amy's smile vanished, and I cursed myself for clumsiness. Let's hope so, she said soberly. I edged myself into the passenger seat while Amy returned to the house to lock up. How I wished I could help her. She'd been so good to me, so completely selfless and welcoming, that it was doubly hard to see her unhappy. But nothing could be done if she preferred to keep her troubles to herself. I respected her reticence. Too often I have been the unwilling recipient of confidences, knowing full well that later the impulsive babbler would regret her disclosures as much as I regretted hearing them. Least said, soonest mended is an old adage which reflects much wisdom. I could only admire Amy's stoicism and hope that one day, somehow, I should be able to help her. We set off for Fairacre, stopping only once to pick up the groceries. Our pace was sedate, for the faster we went, the shriller grew Tibby's wails of protest from the wicker basket. Even at 35 miles an hour, the noise was ear-splitting. I meant to have told you, shouted Amy above the racket, that I had a letter from Vanessa this morning. She's coming down for a day next week. She's on holiday, I gather. Bring her over if she can spare the time, I shouted back. Amy nodded. Funny thing about Gerald, wasn't it? She said at last. Do you smell a romance? What, between Gerald and Vanessa? Yes, I thought he looked remarkably like a cat that has got at the cream when he spoke of her. I digested this unwillingly. No, I don't think so, I said finally. He's years older. A mature man, began Amy, and what I recognized as her experienced woman of the world voice, is often exactly what a young thing like Vanessa needs. She probably knows this subconsciously. She's very intelligent, really, under all that dreadful clothing and flowing air. I shall do my best to encourage it. I began to feel alarmed for both innocent parties. Amy, on matchmaking bent, has a flinty ruthlessness, as I know to my cost. On this occasion, however, I decided to keep silent. An ominous pattering sound, as of water upon newspaper, distracted our attention from Vanessa and Gerald and directed it upon Tibby. Thank God for the Macintosh, exclaimed Amy, accelerating slightly. We drew up with a flourish at the schoolhouse and let the cat escape into the kitchen, where she stalked about, sniffing with the, at the unusual cleanliness and with much the same expression of amazement which Amy and I had worn. We unpacked, and Amy insisted on putting a hot water bottle into my bed despite the bright sunshine. We made coffee, and I asked Amy to stay to lunch. Scrambled egg, I said. I can whip eggs with my left hand beautifully. I mustn't, my dear, she said, rising. James comes home tomorrow, and there's a lot to do. Then I won't keep you, I said, and went on to try and thank her once again for all she had done. She brushed my efforts aside. It was good to have company, she said. Well, you'll have James now. Only for a day or so. We've a lot to discuss before the holiday. Some of it, I fear, not very agreeable. She climbed into the car and waved goodbye, leaving me to savor her last sentence. I was to discover later it was the biggest understatement of Amy's life. And we will find out the details of Amy's understatement next time.